they wouldn't die. This is what Bruce Bochy, the man who managed the 2012 Giants, had to say about his players at the team's 10-year reunion. In attendance this day were 24 cockroaches, 24 players who GM Brian Sabian said just couldn't be killed. Now, while they may have won their second World Series in just three years, the 2012 Giants seemed, for lack of a better word, cursed. They'd won it all in 2010, their first ring since the team moved to San Francisco. The very next year, though, they finished with just 86 wins, second to the Diamondbacks in the NL West. They lost Rookie of the Year Buster Posey to a brutal leg injury, and he missed most of the 2011 season. All-star closer Brian Wilson had Tommy John surgery in early 2012, putting him out for a year. On top of that, NL Hits leader Melky Cabrera was suspended 50 games in August after testing positive for testosterone. Put that all together, then sprinkle in the Dodgers trade for Josh Beckett, Carl Crawford, and Adrian Gonzalez, and the Giants look destined to fail. Uh, I don't I don't even know who's going to play third base for us right now because Nick Punto is gone. I'm sure maybe Pedro Seriaco will play third base. I had a dream last night that Pedro Seriaco died. Uh, that's strange, but... Um, I guess I'll just end the video now. Yet, by the end of the season, it was San Francisco that stood atop the division, having beaten LA by eight games. Even though they'd won the West without much trouble, the 2012 playoffs were anything but easy for the Giants. Between the NLDS and the NLCS, they played 12 games. Of those 12, half of them were win or go home. With no room for error, players like Marco Scudero and Ryan Vogelsong stepped up to lead, becoming fan favorites in the process. When they made the return to the park in 2022, it was to uproarious applause. Also present at this 10-year reunion, however, was another member of the 2012 squad, one with a more turbulent legacy. Depending on who you talk to, Barry Zito is either one of the best pitchers of the early 2000s or one of the bigger letdowns in recent baseball history. He's been at the top of the game and as close to the bottom as a player can get. But one thing's for sure, without him, the Giants' dynasty of the early 2010s never would have happened. The story of Barry Zito begins, naturally, with Nat King Cole. Nat King Cole was jazz royalty. He's considered one of the best pianists and singers of his time, and was one of the most iconic voices in America. In the early 60s, Roberta Rosser, then a freshman at UCLA, auditioned to be one of Cole's backup singers. She won the job, which was how she first met Cole's music director, Joe Zito. The two hit it off, and in 1964, Joe and Roberta got married. They had two daughters and a son, Barry, in 1978. Barry Zito spent most of his childhood in San Diego, where his family moved when he was seven. San Diego was known for a lot of things in the 80s. Unfortunately for Joe Zito, a thriving music industry was not one of them. With few job opportunities to speak of, Joe had to come up with another outlet for his creativity. Now it happened that his son had just started playing for the local Little League team. And not only that, he actually seemed to be pretty good at it. In his very first game, Barry was told to go to his favorite position. He immediately ran to the mound. Joe Zito was not much of a sports guy, but he did know talent when he saw it. So when an umpire told him that he'd never seen a kid with a natural curveball like Barry's, he made it his mission to become an expert on the game. People will say you can't teach pitching out of a book. Joe disagreed. Every night, Barry's father would stay up reading baseball books by himself. The next day, he would read those same pages over again with his son. He quit his job to become Barry's full-time coach. He videotaped his workouts, had him train every day, and even got him lessons with former Cy Young winner Randy Jones. Now, you might be wondering why Joe Zito spent all this time and effort on baseball when he could have easily brought his son up in the music world. As Barry explained years later, his father saw music as a dead end, at least professionally. You could be the best musician in the world, Joe said, but without the right people behind you, you won't get anywhere. Baseball, on the other hand, with baseball, all you need is talent. If you can master three pitches, Joe told his son, scouts will go to the end of the earth to find you. As it turned out though, all Barry really needed was one. Barry Zito's curveball is one of the most iconic pitches in recent memory. Like Mariano Rivera and the cutter, or Nolan Ryan's fastball, rarely has a pitcher become so intertwined with a single pitch as Zito has been with his curve. When he did throw his fastball, it was usually just a way to set up the devastating 12-6 breaking ball that was reminiscent of vintage Dwight Gooden, Burt Blylevin, or even Sandy Koufax. 
After some time at UC Santa Barbara, Pierce College, and later USC, where he earned Pac-10 Pitcher of the Year honors as a junior, Barry found himself playing in the Cape Cod League. It was there, on a rainy day in Edison, New Jersey, that everything changed. Like I said, if it was about baseball and it was written down, Joe Zito was going to read it. So when he saw an ad for former pitcher Rick Langford's throwing program, he immediately jumped on it. Langford was a coach for Toronto, so Joe, as you do, called the Blue Jays on his phone. He asked to speak with Rick, and to his credit, he got Rick. For the next two hours, Joe and Rick talked about Barry, pitching, and Barry's pitching. It was only when their conversation came to a close that Joe realized he'd made a mistake. See, the man on the other end of the line was indeed a pitching coach, and he did work for the Jays. But he wasn't Rick Langford. Joe had actually just been introduced to Rick Peterson, pitching coordinator for the Blue Jays minor leagues. As fate would have it though, Peterson was about to be Barry Zito's key to the show. In an empty high school parking lot, using a painted line as a rubber, Peterson watched as Barry spun curveballs through the rain like tornadoes. He needed only one word to describe that day. Magical. So after the A's hired Peterson to be an instructor in 1998, it's not surprising that Oakland picked Barry ninth overall the very next year. Barry flew through the minors, starting out the 2000 season on the AAA team in Sacramento. Barely a year after signing his first pro contract, Barry Zito made his MLB debut. The Angels were visiting town, bringing bats like Mo Vaughn, Tim Salmon, and Garrett Anderson. In the fifth inning, Zito found himself facing down the heart of the Angels' order, with no outs and the bases loaded. He struck them out in 13 pitches. Barry started 14 games that season, putting together a 2.72 ERA. The A's, meanwhile, not only won the division, but had tapped the rookie to start Game 4 of the ALDS against the Yankees. Over six electric innings, Zito held New York to just seven hits. The sold-out crowd was left stunned as this 22-year-old silenced a dynasty. Oakland would eventually lose the series, but for Barry, it was only the beginning. 2001 was even better for Zito. He had an MLB best 35 starts, and his 8.6 strikeouts per nine would be a career high. More important than his strikeout rate, however, was what was happening around him. See, 2001 also saw the emergence of Oakland's Big Three, a trio of homegrown pitchers made up of Tim Hudson, Mark Mulder, and of course, Barry Zito. If you lived through this era of baseball, you're probably well aware of just how dominant the Big Three were. From 2000 until 2004, when Hudson and Mulder were both traded away, they combined for 234 wins, over 2,200 strikeouts, and a 3.54 ERA. They led the A's to four straight playoff appearances, the first time that had happened since 1975. They were a historically great rotation, and Barry was an ace. At no point was this more apparent than in 2002. He signed a four-year extension in May, and won his 10th game a month and a half later. By midsummer, he was on pace to win 27 games. He was named an All-Star for the first time, and finished out the season with an even stronger second half. Now, if your only exposure to the 2002 Athletics is Moneyball... Just saying, his girlfriend is a six at best. Look, if we're trying to replace Tiambi, this guy could be it. I agree, yes. What you might not know is that Oakland's then-record 20-game win streak couldn't have happened without Barry Zito. The Ace won five games during that stretch, allowing just seven earned runs over 33 innings. Zito went 8-0 over his last 10 games in 2002, dropping his season ERA to 2.75. He finished the season with 182 strikeouts, a league-leading 23 wins, and the AL Cy Young. He edged out three-time winner Pedro Martinez by 18 points, and was the first A's pitcher to win the award since Dennis Eckersley in 1992. In just a couple years, Zito had skyrocketed to the top of Major League Baseball. But there was something different between Barry and your average MLB star. He surfed, danced, and meditated. He acted on TV and dated movie stars. He dyed his hair, played guitar, and did yoga before games. I'm gonna be in this game for a long time, he told Esquire in June of 2002. I wanna make my mark. In the four years after his Cy Young campaign, Zito posted an ERA plus of 115. At no point since his rookie year had he started fewer than 34 games a season, and he averaged over 220 innings for half a decade. Which is why some were surprised to find that despite the success, Barry still had his struggles. Tim Hudson warned that Zito could often be too analytical, putting too much thought into things that sometimes have no rhyme or reason. 
first baseman Chris Pratt, I mean, Scott Hatterberg, said that Barry was, quote, constantly bombarding himself with the mental part of the game. Everybody's trying to get a mental edge, but he takes it to another level. It's been said that Barry Zito's career is a lot like his curveball, and what goes up must come down. In the closing paragraphs of that Esquire profile, author Chris Jones compared Barry to notorious baseball weirdos like Bill Lee, Oil Ken Boyd, and Mark Fidrich. Like those three, Zito excelled at drawing attention to himself. Okay, now you try. <laughs> Gotta come deep. And, like those three, Barry was about to learn the downside of standing out. It makes you a target. He became a free agent after the 2006 season. As a 28-year-old ace, many expected Zito to sign a record contract. And he did, inking a seven-year, $126 million deal with the Giants. It was the most money ever paid to a pitcher, and owner Peter McGowan called it the team's most important signing since Barry Bonds. But other than that, no pressure. At his first spring training with his new club, Zito told reporters that he was changing his delivery in order to use his legs more when throwing. They asked him if it made sense to do that, given, you know, everything. But as he explained, Tiger Woods changed his swing a couple times when he was at the top of his game, if he can pull it off. Anyway, through the end of July, Zito found himself at 7 and 10. He wasn't lasting into games like he did in Oakland, and he was putting more and more pressure on himself to save a foundering Giants season. He did finish strong over his last nine starts in 2007, closing out the season with an eight-inning, two-run outing against the Dodgers, who were themselves in fourth place that year. But whatever goodwill he had left from Giants fans in 2007, it was completely gone within the next year. Zito started 2008 by going 0-8 in his first nine games, and it didn't really get much better from there. His ERA was an atrocious 6-2-5, and opponents were hitting 337 off of him. That year saw him notch a career-worst 17 losses, tied for the most in MLB. His strikeout rate was down, his walks were up, and opponents were squaring him up more than ever before. His fastball, which had sat between 88 and 92 while in Oakland, had dropped to an average speed of 83.7 miles per hour. His curve, meanwhile, had lost its bite, and he was struggling with locating all of his pitches. The Cy Young winner from just a few years before had vanished. I'm not going to spend much more time talking about Barry Zito's stats with the Giants. They aren't good, for sure, but they also aren't horrendous. He averaged 33 starts for the first four years, and outside of his contract, there really wasn't a huge difference between his performance and your typical middle-of-the-rotation arm. But the contract was a problem, at least for those who felt like Zito had failed to live up to his, again, Barry Bonds-level expectations. Now, just a few years later, he was being squeezed out of the rotation altogether. Barry was taking more and more of a backseat to younger, homegrown talent like Tim Lincecum, Matt Cain, and Madison Bumgarner. This all culminated in October of 2010, when news broke that Barry Zito, San Francisco's $126 million man, was being left off the playoff roster entirely. You know, but when Bochi told me in 2010, hey, you know, we're gonna go to the playoffs and we gotta take our top four guys, and I'm sorry, you know, like, I was like, dude, Boach, like, I've been working my whole life for a World Series. How am I right. going to go home right now? Like, I was miserable, man. I mean, my boys were out there doing what I always dreamed and trying to act, you know, happy in the champagne celebrations every, as we advance every round and trying to hide in my locker most days and pull my hoodie over. And, I mean, it was a nightmare. Man. Yeah. It was the evening of March 30th, 2011, and Barry Zito was driving down Sunset Boulevard. The Giants were in L.A. for the weekend, preparing for their opening day matchup against the Dodgers. The game was scheduled for 5 p.m. the next day, but Barry wasn't supposed to pitch until Sunday at the earliest. It had been three years at this point since he'd last started an opening day game. As he was taking a left turn at an intersection, another driver ran the red light, broadsiding Barry's car. He was taken to Cedars sinai Hospital, but after a few tests, he was found to be more or less fine, if badly shaken. Now, I'm not usually one to put stock in bad omens, or good omens for that matter. I'm not a big omen guy in general. But for someone who entered the season having made 353 consecutive starts, 2011 was uncharacteristically unhealthy for Zito. He sprained his foot while fielding a bunt on April 16th, landing him on the DL for the first time in his 12-year career. 
He did pitch pretty well after coming back that June, but as the summer wore on, he started to falter. When Jonathan Sanchez returned from the DL on August 1st, there was yet another shortage of rotation spots to go around. Barry was placed on the DL again. The team cited lingering foot soreness. He made only 13 appearances in 2011, posting a 5.87 ERA. Now, I've already talked about the anger many fans had felt as they watched Barry Zito, the pitcher who had been promised to finally lead them to a title, fall short time and time again. But here's the thing. It's hard to be angry for that long. It takes effort to hold a grudge, and this might just be me talking, but it doesn't feel that good either. After a certain amount of time, you usually forget what you were mad about in the first place. And that's pretty much what happened with Giants fans. After the win in 2010, and a lost season from Barry Zito in 2011, they were happy to just let it all go. As for Barry, he was beginning to look for answers outside of baseball. He'd been leaning more into music, to the point where when he wasn't training, he was in the studio playing. Seeing him go from one extreme to another though, his wife Amber told him that he should slow down. So he did. Around that time also experiencing a spiritual rebirth, one which provided him with quote, structure. 2012 started out on a hopeful note. In his first game of the season, Zito pitched a complete game shutout against the Rockies in Colorado. It was his first one since 2003. Barry Zito started 32 games in 2012, going 15 and eight. His ERA wasn't stellar, but he was a dependable number four starter for the NL West winning Giants. He won his 150th career game in June and was able to land a spot on the postseason roster that October. His first playoff game since 2006 was less than great. He was chased out of game three by the Reds after giving up two runs over three innings. The Giants would win that game and the NLDS, pitting them against the Cardinals in the championship series. The 2012 NLCS was a hard-fought one for San Francisco. After splitting the first two games at home, they dropped games three and four at Busch Stadium. Entering game five, their odds to win the series sat at just 13%. If they could win game five though, they'd get the home field advantage back, plus their two most reliable arms in Vogelsong and Kane, which meant that when Barry Zito made his way to the mound in front of an away crowd of 47,000, he did so with the weight of the Giants' season on his back. The Cardinals were the second highest scoring team in the league and crushed left-handed pitching. They were coming off of a World Series win of their own, a seven-game nail-biter versus the Rangers, and were no strangers to high-pressure moments. Lance Lynn had the ball for them, and he promptly retired the first three San Francisco batters in order. Giants fans watched with bated breath as Barry would try to do the same. He retired leadoff hitter John Jay, only for Carlos Beltran to send a hanging curve into left for a single. Beltran then stole second, leaving Zito with a runner in scoring position to worry about. Luckily, he had Pablo Sandoval at third base, who snagged a line drive in foul territory to get him out of the inning. They entered the top of the second with the heart of their order facing Lynn, hoping to give Barry some time to breathe. This didn't go as planned. Zito quickly got into trouble again when Yadier Molina lined a single to left, followed by a David Freese double and an intentional walk to load the bases with one away. With Lance Lynn up to bat though, there was an opportunity for an easy out. On an 0-1 count, Zito was able to get Lynn to roll over a curveball, shattering his bat and hitting into an inning-ending double play all at once. In this moment, Barry showed just how much he had transformed as a pitcher. 12 years ago, he'd taken down the Yankees with a combo of pitch mixing and raw ability. Now, with a fastball slower than many pitchers' change-ups, he'd have to rely on strategy alone. He didn't break 86 miles per hour all game, but that didn't stop him from sitting down cardinal after cardinal. All five of his pitches were working, fastball, slider, cutter, sinker, and especially the curve. He pitched to each unique situation throughout the game, never settling into a pattern. But while he held the card scoreless, Barry still needed the Giants to score some runs. And it's not like he could do it all himself, right? A little bunt down the third baseline, great play, and safe, another run for the Giants. David Fries at third base playing way back. Zito saw it and puts a perfect bunt down there. We talked about how good Barry Zito had never hit a bunt single in his career. And yet, to everyone, and maybe even his own surprise, he just legged one out on a national stage. The fan support came pouring in. He made it to the eighth inning before finally retiring for the night with six strikeouts and in line for the win. 
Santiago Casilla and Sergio Romo locked down the final two frames as the Giants turned their series odds around. Vogelsong and Kane did their part, holding St. Louis to one run over the next two games. Without Barry Zito's lockdown performance in Game 5, the Giants' dynasty would have faltered then and there. He wasn't done yet, though. With just one day off before they had to face the Tigers, Zito was the best arm San Francisco had available, which meant that two years after being left off the playoff roster entirely, Barry Zito would now be starting Game 1 of the World Series. He faced Justin Verlander, who had been pretty good as of late. I can get in there. I won't just be perfect. I'll be the most perfect. They'll say, hey, Justin, how do you do it? Well, I'm part cheetah, part ninja. That's how. In fact, I'm a ninja riding a cheetah. Oh, really, Justin? Yeah. What, are you going to do something about it? Maybe I will. I've always wanted to fight a ninja. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, then come on. Bring it. Bring it. Take that and that and that and that and that and that and ninja. You all right, man? Yeah, I'm awesome. Barry held Detroit scoreless through five and even singled in a run off of Verlander for good measure. He handed the ball over to Tim Lincecum in the sixth, having just outpitched the AL MVP himself. San Francisco won game one, then game two, three, and four. After one of the most stressful playoff runs imaginable up to that point, the World Series was more or less a cakewalk for the Giants. The pitching staff kept the Tigers to just six runs over all four games, while series MVP Pablo Sandoval led the way on offense. As the team swarmed the field after the last out, it wasn't tough to spot Barry Zito among them. When he returned to the clubhouse, he found the whole team with the championship trophy held up, chanting his name. It, it was almost like surreal, that, but they were chanting my name, which for me was the biggest outpouring of love coming from your own team that they saw, most of those guys were on that 10 team, so they saw what I went, went through. That was like, wow. He finished out his contract in 2013, which was forgettable to put it gently. Of course, this didn't matter too much to fans after his 2012 heroics. But, fan favored or not, there was no chance the Giants were going to pick up his $18 million option after 2013, leaving Barry unofficially semi-retired. After taking a year off to enjoy life, travel, surf, or as he called it, to reset, Zito attempted a comeback with the A's in 2015. That September, he made his final start in Oakland. He faced his former teammate and member of the Big Three, Tim Hudson, on a Saturday afternoon. Mark Mulder was also in attendance. Barry Zito was, at a glance, not that different from a lot of baseball players. He had a stretch of success early on, won some awards, and then experienced a pretty steady decline as he got older. He was better than most, but most people wouldn't say he's a Hall of Famer. At the same time though, does it matter? Yes, his career numbers might be more in line with James Shields than Randy Johnson, but his personality was unparalleled. It doesn't seem to bother Barry much either, who seems to be keeping himself busy. You want to talk about a heck of a surprise? How about Barry Zito coming in for the bananas here to pitch the bottom of the sixth inning? Barry Zito's legacy is a fractured one. Some will remember him for his dominance in Oakland. Others will remember his time in San Francisco, the disappointment, and the redemption. I, for one, don't quite know what to make of him. And maybe that's the way he wants it. Let me know what you think in the comments, leave a like, and please consider subscribing. It really helps. Okay, bye.